Yeah, I'd like to welcome everybody to our annual gathering of the four boards. Uh, uh, there's a, just for some reason, the finance committee seems to be uh, a little bit later, and I think that there was a problem with some misunderstanding about notice of time, but I appreciate everybody being here. We want to um, start immediately, um, and of course, the purpose of tonight's meeting is to receive the initial presentation as the first part of the budget process for the year ahead where we develop the FY14 budget and uh, we uh, normally and tonight we'll hear from the finance director who's Sandy Pooler who's going to talk a little bit about um, recent and long-term trends and finances um, for the town and his projection for the year ahead and uh, you, uh, um, a little bit beyond. Um, and uh, that will provide the information that will be used by um, all of the boards and committees. The Finance Committee will uh, develop, got, meet, be meeting with Mr. Pooler over the next few weeks and um, using the information to uh, develop our preliminary guidelines, which um, then go to um, the rest of you to help you in developing um, your preliminary budgets. Uh, the goal is to have the guidelines issued about November 1st. And as part of the presentation, Sandy will also um, talk briefly about the schedule, which is fairly similar to prior years. Um, before um, turning it over to Sandy, um, our town manager, John Musanti, wants to say a few words. Great. Uh, thank you, Andy, and I want to welcome everybody to Town Hall uh, for what has become an annual event kicking off our, our budget planning process together. And one of the many things that sets Amherst apart is the fact that we do this work together, uh, the town side, the library, schools. Uh, and the greater community together. Um, uh, you know, the budget uh, plan that we'll ultimately present to town meeting next spring, you know, uh, reflects our community's values, uh, which uh, certainly include outstanding public schools, uh, high quality public library services in all parts of town, uh, uh, fundamentally sound and strong public safety, police, fire, ambulance, uh, maintaining our streets, caring for our seniors, caring for our young people, uh, preserving neighborhoods, all, all kinds of things. Um, but our goal, I think, uh, must be, and I think the challenge that's before all of us uh, really is to maintain the discipline uh, that we've shown over the past several years uh, both fiscally and I think programmatically uh, to get to that place where we're able to uh, deliver and then maintain high quality services in both good times and bad times. You know, we've gone through a, a relatively rocky period uh, in the period uh, 2008 uh, with the recession and the extended downturn. We're in a more stable place. And so the trick now really is to <coughs> use the same sense of discipline uh, as we as we construct our our budget priorities for the coming year, so that we don't have we don't return to the kind of a roller coaster ride of uh, state aid ups and downs and corresponding swings in our ability to deliver uh, town school and library services. So uh, uh, we're in a much better place than we were. There's a lot more to do, and uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Sandy. If I could. Oh yeah. Just uh, before, right and before we turn it over to Sandy, um, a couple words about logistics. First of all, to the regional folks, I apologize. We don't typically have the regional folks come to this meeting, so we did not set up for you. Does not mean you're not welcome because you are, and we're so glad you're here. But you don't have name tags. But just sit anywhere. Um, also, please make sure to speak directly into the microphones. Obviously, we have a very large group here. We have to share the microphones. You can tell the difference in the amplification in the room if I'm speaking into this versus if I'm not. So that makes a very big difference as to uh, the ability of other folks to hear us. Also, obviously, this is being broadcast and re-recorded uh, and rebroadcast rather uh, on ACTV. So please be, uh, try to be conscious of speaking directly into the mics. And when Sandy is done, we will take questions. So thank you very much, Sandy. 
Um, thank you very much. This is a very powerful microphone. Um, so there are two handouts that you have in front of you. One um, looks like this, and it's, uh, I'm going to start with the information that is in here in terms of some of the slides. The second one has these red stripes on the front, and when we get into some of the, the numbers, we'll refer to that. For those of you watching at home, um, this is all on the town website. Um, if you go to the town website under uh, the heading of government and budget, uh, it will take you right to the um, FY14 budget page, and there are a couple of documents right there at the top that are the things I'm going to be going through right now. And because when I do these things, I like to stand, I'm going to move over here. And um, ACTV will be broadcasting these slides um, as we go through. So um, first of all, welcome and thank you for coming out tonight. Um, for people who are budget people, this is one of the most exciting days of the year. <laughs> <laughs> for the rest of you, thank you for coming. Um, tonight's agenda, um, and by the way, this and that are the, the same thing. Um, we will go through this 10-year fiscal trend monitoring report, uh, which is John said has been a um, kind of tradition here in Amherst. Uh, it was developed a few years ago with the help of some students at UMass. And it just gives us uh, a big picture of what the town's financial condition is. Um, and then I will review um, the fiscal year we just came out of, um, where we are in the current fiscal year, and then what everybody wants to know is where we're going in the, in the coming fiscal year. Um, talk about um, some of the numbers, some of the schedule, and then I'll sit back down and we'll answer any questions you have. All right, what's tonight's takeaway? Slow and steady budget. Um, really, as I think of it, um, as John said, um, a budget is not just numbers, it embodies our values. And um, what I'm going to present to you tonight in terms of budget um, maintains the values of maintaining consistently high quality services over time, from year to year. A budget isn't just something to think about as a one year time frame, but think about in the long run. Um, our ability to maintain fiscal discipline both in good years and bad years has been a hallmark of Amherst over the years and has shown our ability um, to plan, to conserve, and to have the resources um, when we need them. And really, I think one of the most important things to keep in mind is that our uh, FY14 budget is built on a strong FY13 base. And when we get into the numbers, um, it will become a little more obvious. But um, I think going into the future, we have a lot of challenges um, out there in terms of what's going on in the federal government and the economy and so forth. Um, we have a solid base in 13, and that is really going to make a huge difference for us in what we're going to be able to do um, for FY14. Um, so now I'm going to get into this part of the slides. And um, first thing, I just want to give an overview, and again, particularly for the people at home uh, who may not have uh, be may not be as familiar with the budget as some of the other people in the room. Um, big picture, what does our budget look like in our current fiscal year, which is FY13? Um, and this is the general fund. And I just point that out, that we have a general fund. In addition, we have things like our water and sewer fund and our trash fund and our parking fund. But the general fund is really where the bulk of our, our spending happens. And the bulk of the money that comes into the general fund comes from the property tax. Almost two-thirds of our revenue is from the property tax. The next biggest area is uh, state aid in the general fund. And then the local receipts, which are the fees and fines and uh, other charges that we have. And then there are some uh, other financing sources, which primarily are, are money from uh, the ambulance fund that, that uh, we run an ambulance service, and that generates money to help support the fire department and other things. Um, but I think the most important thing to keep in mind is our, our really our biggest sources are property tax and state aid. In terms of how we spend the money, 29% um, goes to town functions, 32% to the elementary schools, 
21% to the region, and then um, the rest of it is, is mixed up uh, among um, unappropriated uses, which are really the, the money we have to give to the state when uh, they assess us for various um, services that they provide to us, capital, um, to the Jones Library, um, and miscellaneous. Um, all right, let's get into some of the numbers. Again, for the people at home, I want to just give you a little bit of an overview. And for those of you who haven't seen this before, um, I'm going to do a series of slides. Um, there are uh, about a dozen of these slides, each of which has a graph like this. And then down below is a narrative explanation of what's on the slide. And then this um, nice little kind of traffic-like system we have here, uh, green, yellow, and red, you'll see, which will indicate our judgment as to whether this trend is a favorable one, what we call marginal, so it's sort of in the middle, um, or unfavorable, and whether uh, we sort of know what's going on into the future here or whether there's some uncertainty about what's happening. Um, so the first thing I want to talk about is property tax. Um, Property tax, as I said, is the biggest source of revenue. And uh, what this um, chart shows in the blue line is our history of property taxes over the last 10 years, um, both on an actual basis, what we've actually collected. And the other thing that we do is we go and we look at it on an inflation-adjusted basis. So we, uh, the federal government produces data that shows what um, inflation has been from year to year. And so we go back from the beginning year, which in this case is uh, 2003, um, and use that as a base. And so we say if, um, for example, if inflation was 3% in one year, but our property tax only went up by 2%, then there'd be a little gap on, on, a, uh, on a constant dollar basis. You're always falling behind inflation a little bit. And in fact, this is what you can see over time, that um, our property taxes, have grown consistently, um, but um, not quite at the pace of inflation. The other important thing to note here is that um, because of Prop 2 and a half, the state law that defines how much you can raise in property tax every year, you do see an up, a steady upward slope. But there are a couple of times when there are kind of bigger bumps, in 2005 and six, and also 2011. And those were times when there were property tax overrides, when the voters were asked and voluntarily decided to increase their property taxes in order to support services. So in some years when we've had overrides, there have been bigger bumps, and then in those other years you see a more or less steady increase. Um, because property taxes are such a big part of our revenue, it's important to know that we're doing a good job collecting them. <laughs> um, and so this indicates um, how well we've been doing. Um, and this has got a nice green check and green box here because it's been very, very <laughs> favorable. Um, we typically collect between 98 and 99% of our property taxes in any one year. So sometimes, some years we even collect more than that because it's, um, you're kind of collecting from previous years. Um, but um, this is a strong trend for the town of Amherst. Uh, bond rating agencies look at this um, and they think that if you if this number is anywhere over 5%, then that's a warning sign. So we're well below that, and um, we have a good history of, of managing that revenue collection. State aid has been a bit of a challenge. Um, as you can see, over the last um, four years, um, it's declined. Um, from a peak in 2008, we've had declines in 2009, 10, 11, 12. And then in 2013, the budget that was voted at town meeting uh, was pretty much the same at, as we had in 2012. I'll get, as I'll get into later, we subsequently got some additional state aid. But in terms of what's in the baseline budget and what we're using on an ongoing basis, it was pretty much flat. Um, and then on a constant dollar basis, as, as I say, the inflation adjusted <coughs> basis, we're not keeping up with inflation. Um, over the last five years, we've lost $3.6 million in state aid. Um, so, tremendous challenge for us. Um, means that we're more and more reliant on property taxes as the years go by. <coughs> this is state aid as a percentage of our total budget. 
Um, when I say our total budget, I mean the general fund, the water fund, the sewer fund, all those. And um, we get a lot of these numbers, by the way, from um, the state of Massachusetts has, uh, in their Department of Revenue, they have a website, something called the Division of Local Services, and they publish um, these numbers, and we use them in this report so there can be some consistency from year to year. And also, if you want to compare our numbers to numbers in other communities, you can do it on an apples-to-apples -apples basis. So uh, in the general fund, I showed you before property taxes are 20% of the general fund. As our total budget um, uh, in 2013, they're 17%. But I think the more important thing from this graph is to look at um, the trend um, that state aid has shrunk and uh, over the years as a percentage of our total operating budget. Um, this next slide shows revenue from two important sources. New growth, which means when new things are built in the town, so somebody puts up a new house, or for those of you who like um, granite countertops in your kitchen, if you renovate your kitchen and, and the assessors come by and raise your taxes, that's called new growth too. Um, so um, that is directly uh, related to the state of the economy. Obviously, if there are more home sales and so forth, you get more new growth or more businesses are opening and so forth. Um, the other thing that's reflected in here is um, the motor vehicle excise tax. It's a, a tax that cities and towns can collect on your automobiles. Um, and both of those together, as a percentage of our overall budget, showed declines for several years. Um, so we have an unfavorable trend. In FY12, uh, as we close things out then, we actually saw an increase in both of those areas. I think it's an indication um, for example, home sales, uh, the assessors tell us that we have about double the number of home sales this year as we did a year ago. The price at which they're selling um, has not changed significantly, but there's more turnover. And so when you have that turnover, then people do tend to do things like renovate their kitchens or, or, or add a room and so forth when you have a sale. And the other thing is that we know both nationally and, and, and uh, in Massachusetts that automobile sales are up. There's a consistent trend, and that's reflected in our, um, our motor vehicle excise taxes. So um, I think even though it's been an unfavorable trend now, it's, it gives us a little bit of hope um, for the future. I think these numbers have looked a little bit better. All right, so if we put all these three together, property taxes, local receipts, and state aid, you see we've had increasing use of property taxes uh, on a dollar amount. Our local receipts, the purple line here, have uh, been more or less even, and then um, state aid has went, went up and then has been down over the last uh, five years. And then the same thing on that constant dollar or inflation-adjusted basis. You see the same trends here. Um, and in fact, that uh, both local receipts and state aid have not kept pace with inflation. Um, that was the revenue side. Now we're going to talk about expenditures for a second. And um, here we see um, ex operating expenditures on a per capita or per person basis. Um, so in 2003, we were spending about $1,300 per resident. Um, now we're up a little over $1,600. Um, so we have seen... Uh, Kind of a steady increase, a little bit of dip in 2010, and, and then back up kind of to those same levels in 2012. Again, on an inflation-adjusted basis, um, we're just slightly above where we were 10 years ago. So um, I, I think what this shows us is that the town has um, consistently tried to constrain um, expenses and to... Um, increase our, our services at a, at a reasonable rate in terms of wage adjustments and, and so forth, but there hasn't been a big spurt in spending. It's been a slow, steady uh, increase. We then break this down by category. Um, this is a very colorful but kind of somewhat funny slide. <laughs> um, and it shows of the uh, major areas in our budget um, how 
they um, have compared over time. Uh, so intergovernmental spending has gone up by the highest percentage of anything. It has not gone up by the highest dollar amount. In your packet, in the hands out, you, you, on the second page right behind that, uh, you can see the actual dollar amounts. But that is um, it's sort of a fluky thing because it has to do with um, the money that the schools reimburse the town for the school choice, charter choice, um, and retired teachers' health insurance. So it's a little bit of a fluke. Um, what I would focus on is the ones below that. Debt service and fixed costs, and within fixed costs is the cost of health insurance for our employees. And so you can see over time that's been one of the biggest growth areas of our, our spending on a percentage basis. Um, culture and recreation, which includes the library in there, um, has, has been a relatively big increase. Um, other things, human services has hardly changed at all, and public works has actually declined somewhat over time. Uh, the school budget has gone up uh, on an average 3.8% per year over the last 10 years. Um, police and fire, 2.5%, and then our general government, which is the administrative functions here within town hall, 1.4%. Uh, so I guess I would focus on this part of the chart, um, and you can see how relatively things have uh, expanded. Um, this is the same thing on an inflation-adjusted basis. Um, so on an inflation-adjusted basis, we're actually falling behind in some of these categories. Um, and it really, I think it goes to show that you know, our commitment to public safety and education on an inflation-adjusted basis, we, we try to keep pace. The uh, health insurance benefits are something that we've just had to cover, and everybody knows that, uh, and we'll get into some of the numbers a little more specifically in a couple of slides, what a, what a um, challenge that has been. Um, In terms of keeping our expenses down, uh, this shows how many people um, work uh, on the town side. This is the municipal side of the government. And there has been a steady decrease um, from 204 uh, people uh, 10 years ago to 190 now. Um, and within public safety, uh, we have stayed pretty much the same as we are from 10 years ago. There's been some ups and downs. Um, and then we've had uh, a few grant positions that uh, have fluctuated a little bit. But um, overall, I think this reflects doing more with less, trying to have efficiencies, take advantage of technology, and, um, and frankly, in some years, just having to make some tough choices about making cuts and, uh, and implementing those. Um, I said before that we look a lot at um, health insurance benefits as a major driver of costs. And what this slide shows us, um, in the red bars are total salaries and, and benefits. Um, those have continued to increase, although we did have a, a, a dip in 2012. Um, I think the interesting thing here in this, um, in this slide is, is the green line. The, total employee benefit spending as a percentage of, of wages and salaries. So um, how much, when you're looking at everybody's total compensation, how much of that is being made up of, of their benefits as opposed to their direct salaries? And uh, in the first 10 years, and particularly from 2005 to 2008, um, that was shooting up and was really a problem. The town had some major problems uh, with funding of health insurance, and the health insurance trust fund got into a lot of trouble, and then People like John Musanti came in and saved the day <laughs> and helped fix it. Um, <laughs> but um, it is then notable that since then, this line has been relatively flat. And I think one of the big successes that we've had is the ability to constrain health insurance costs over the last five years. Um, so that has been a major success. It's been done by some creative um, restructuring of the benefits package, the kind of health insurance that we provide. And it's also been done uh, with the collaboration and communication with our employees, um, both unionized and non-union employees, having some good dialogue with them about the consequences of health insurance costs and working collaboratively to come up with those uh, benefit changes and um, different structures for how we provide health insurance so we can keep those costs down. Um, and um, from my experience, 
here in town and looking at other parts of the state, other cities and towns, I think um, Amherst is really ahead of the game in being able to get on top of that and uh, have a successful um, experience, again, at least in the, in the last five years. Um, final couple of slides here, I want to talk about our debt service um, because um, this really goes to the issue of how we're investing in our infrastructure and um, what our capacity to do that is. Um, with the debt, there are two things you need to think about. One, your overall total amount of debt that you issue, and then um, how you pay for it. So I, I like to think of it as um, you know, how many credit cards you have and how are you going to pay off those credit cards. <laughs> Just because you have more credit cards doesn't mean you, you, you are, you're already richer. Um, but um, what these next two, this, these two graphs and, and then two on the next uh, slide are going to show is that our debt service as a total percentage of our general fund revenue um, is very low. Um, in 2012, it was 3.8%. It's actually declined over the last decade. So it means that we're not overly reliant on, on debt. And certainly as a debt service, on a per capita basis, it's $66 per resident, which if you look at those numbers compared to um, other communities around the state, it's, it is very low. Um, so in terms of our ability to borrow and our ability to, to go out to um, the bond market and to the rating agencies and show that we've been fiscally prudent and not over relying on debt. I think these are very favorable numbers. Um, and uh, just, I think, is one reason we have um, kind of the, the second highest rating, bond rating that, that you can have in the state. Um, the, um, the other slide shows um, <coughs> our long term debt, the total long term debt as a percentage of our assessed valuation. So if you take the value of all the houses and businesses and taxable property in the town, and then you say what our percentage of debt is compared to that, our total debt compared to that, um, it's really minuscule. And, and we put this up here because this is a number that um, the bond rating agencies uh, look at um, a lot to see kind of what our capacity is. And then down here, we just show our long-term debt per capita. And I just compared that. I went into the state statistics uh, about a month ago to look at what that same number was um, for the AAA rated communities, the highest rated communities. And for them, it's $2,075. For Amherst, it's $280. So um, indeed, we've been, um, we've been very prudent in our issuance of debt. Um, and um, the final slide here is about reserves. Um, the money that we've socked away um, for rainy days or the money that we've taken out of those funds for rainy days. The town has uh, financial policies. Um, those policies say that our reserves, which are a combination of what's known as our free cash, which is if you're a business person, it's um, basically your fund balance, um, and something called a stabilization fund, which is a special fund that uh, town meeting votes money into from time to time as a reserve. If you add those two together, Town policies say they should be between 5 and 15% of our total uh, budget in any one year. So back in 2003, we were way up into, um, at 17%. And then because of uh, difficult ec economic times and cutbacks in state aid and so forth, that, that amount was drawn down until about 2006. And then really, it, it couldn't be drawn down anymore. And um, that was when you saw um, uh, in some of these middle years, some of the cuts in, in uh, services. Um, we've started to, to creep up again, and um, we don't have a final number for what our free cash number is. We've submitted it to the state. You'll see that number in a couple of slides. But um, this year, if it comes in where we estimate it, we'll be at 9.3%, so sort of at that midway mark between uh, the 5 and 15%. Um, so it's, is a, um, it has been a sort of marginal trend over time. I think recently it's been a uh, positive trend. Um, and, you know, it's, 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 um, it does kind of keep, bring to mind you know, the, the seven lean years and seven fat years. You, you have to save when you can so because we know inevitably 
there will be more downturns and we'll have to look at these reserves again in the future to preserve our services. All right, now you can go back to the other handout. So I just want to do a quick review of uh, the year we just came out of. Um, on an operating basis, uh, we had a uh, million dollar surplus um, in FY12. These are numbers that we went over with the Finance Committee and the Select Board about a month ago, um, and they're up on the, the town webpage. Um, so we have uh, a total surplus of about 1.7% uh, percent of our budget was excess revenues. Um, that number has, is consistent with the kind of surpluses that we've generated in past years. Um, we always generate a surplus. Um, it's a very bad thing for a town not to generate a surplus. You're always somewhat conservative in your revenue estimates, and of course you, you work very hard. In fact, it's, uh, you're not, it's not really legal to overspend your budget. So uh, and for those two reasons, you generate a surplus. Um, so we've had reasonable and conservative revenue estimates. We've had strong collection of our property taxes. And uh, the voters, uh, town meeting, uh, took the action to adopt some local taxes o over the last few years, the hotel, motel, and meals tax, which um, have been a good and significant source of local revenue. Um, FY12, we had a um, base state aid cut of a half a million dollars, about 4% uh, of our state aid was cut. We then, in the fall of 2011, got a one-time um, restoration of that money. Uh, the state budget had a provision that said if there was a surplus in that budget, they would give us it as one-time money, and we put the bulk of that into the stabilization fund. Um, unspent appropriations in 2012 uh, were $69,000, or 0.1% of the budget. This is the rubbing two nickels together way of spending your budget. We, you know, uh, we monitor spending very carefully. There's not, there's no fat in these budgets, um, and and the fact that we spent at this level, I think, reflects that. Um, there were two major appropriations that were returned. We had seven hundred ninety-six thousand dollars of free cash that had appropriated one for the Puffers Pond Grant, uh, which the state did not award to us and also some money for the ice storm uh, from 2011 in October. Um, those are returned to free cash, and those will be part of our free cash balances that are certified by the state this fall. Um, and significantly, we had very good results with our employee health care. Um, we negotiated plan design changes uh, to increase our um, office visit co-pays. Um, and um, because of that, we had a zero increase in our premiums last year. Um, clearly well below anything that's going on in, in the private sector or, or generally. Um, we maintained our double-A uh, uh, bond rating. I want to say triple-A because I'm hoping one day we'll get there. I think there's a lot of good reasons we should. But uh, Standard & Poor's has said good things about the town, recognizing our strong management, our strong basic economic base with, with these colleges and universities in this area we've been relatively insulated from the fluctuations in, in the economy compared to other parts of the state. Um, and as I say, our reserves and free cash balance we're estimating to be at $6.2 million. Um, it, that number will grow by about $600,000 from last year. Um, it's a, that number is different from the, the number I showed you before in terms of the operating surplus because of the way free cash is calculated by the state. But the positive news is it will see an increase. Um, in that number, and we sh should get us to 9.3 percent of our operating revenue again, within that uh, area of five to 15 percent. Uh, the current year budget, um, we uh, saw level funding of state aid. Uh, we maintained a kind of a level of services, what we called a, a, a no drama budget last year. Uh, the town uh, increased by 2.9 percent. Um, it was slightly above the 2.8% uh, benchmark because we added a little bit of money from the War Memorial Pool, but then they, again, they brought in some more money with their fees. Uh, an increase of 2.8% for the elementary school. Uh, the regional school um, originally was going to go up 2.8%, but then through a series of 
uh, economies and some good news that they have from the state. They were able to, to keep that number down and reduce the assessments to um, to uh, the, the towns. Um, library budget went up a total of 3.65 percent, 2.8 percent from the town's share, um, and capital was at 6.5 percent of our uh, our tax levy, which I'll get into in a minute. Um, and then in 2013, we did have a one-time use of free cash uh, to go to the elementary school budget to get them started, a little kickstart so they get the school choice program up and running without disruption uh, from a financial point of view so it could be, uh, run more smoothly. And then that will kick into their budget in uh, 2014. Um, as I said, after we passed the uh, budget, we had a, a one-time uh, increase in state aid, and um, or excuse me, after we passed the budget this year, the legislature increased our state aid um, by about five hundred and fourteen thousand um, dollars. We are suggesting for this fall town meeting that, with that and some other changes we saw in the FY13 budget, that we take that increase and put it into our OPEB funding. Our OPEB funding is the money we need to set aside for retiree health insurance. It's just like a pension fund, except it's for, for retiree health insurance. Um, so that increase in state aid um, in <coughs> FY13, we're recommending go into uh, an OPEB fund. Also upcoming at this fall town meeting, having to do with the current year, um, is we'll make a recommendation of transferring some of our free cash into the stabilization fund. Our town policies say that free cash, uh, anything above 5% of the budget may be transferred into the stabilization fund. And um, we think this is a good time uh, to implement that policy and to keep free cash at 5% and transfer the excess into the stabilization fund. And once we have a certified free cash number from the state, we'll make that recommendation at fall town meeting. Um, also upcoming at fall town meeting, um, we're looking to recommend a $1 million bond issue to continue repair of our roads. Um, we did a $4.5 million bond a couple of years ago. It made a big dent in the uh, over $20 million uh, backlog of road repairs at that time that needed to be done. Um, now we're at about 17 or 18 million dollars still in a, a backlog. Um, so between the money we get from the state, from Chapter 90, and this bond, we'll continue to chip away and try to generally increase the, the level of our roads. Um, and then finally, um, we're looking forward in the current fiscal year uh, to some recommendations from the Community Preservation Act Committee, in particular some grants that um, will make some major repairs to the North Common area here. And um, so that we have a common that actually I think has some grass on it, which I think everybody would like, um, and, and some nice pathways and lighting, um, and a couple of land acquisitions. So this is just a preview of some of the things that are coming up for ta fall town meeting. All right, um, quick review. Again, this is mostly for people at home, where the money comes from, property taxes, state aid, our local receipts, investment income. Um, uh, in particular, uh, Jones Library has its own endowment account too and from reserves. And where it goes, to education, both regional and elementary school systems, to the libraries, to our municipal departments, um, to our debt, and to, the, to um, the assessments that come from the state. So where are we going uh, into the future? Uh, for FY14, um, you will see the specifics in a minute, but um, our revenues are based, again, mostly on property taxes. We continue to see a 2.5% growth in property taxes as provided for in the law. And this year, uh, the assessor is estimating a half a million dollars in new growth. Um, that is uh, a little bit below the 10-year average, but significantly, it's a lot higher than it has been in the last three years. So we're seeing an upward trend, and that makes a big difference, and it just goes into a base. Um, I'm predicting some very modest growths in, growth in state aid. Um, 
if you look at the state aid, uh, excuse me, the state revenue numbers, they are continuing to grow. Um, they're above where they were last year, but they're not hitting their benchmarks uh, for this year. So um, we're keeping a, a wary eye on uh, state revenues for the current year. Um, and local receipts for us, I mean, they're just, there are only so many fees and, and so forth that we can charge, and so we see that as being relatively flat. And this budget reserves on, uh, relies on no reserves going into FY14. The bottom line of that is that I predict that we can have a 3% increase in our total revenue, uh, which will mean generally a 3% uh, allocation to departments. Um, and I just, um, for those of you who are accountants or are interested in numbers, that 3% is um, absent the $585,000 that I talked about for that OPEB funding in FY13. That will be a, a one-time shot into the OPEB fund. So when I calculated the 3%, I took that number out of FY13. So we do apples to apples in FY14. On the expenditure side, certainly on the, on the, for the town, municipal departments, uh, we're looking at level services, uh, no real expansion. Um, we have all of our collective bargaining agreements open and up for negotiation. So settling reasonable collective bargaining agreements where total compensation, wages, and benefits are within our, um, our capacity is going to be key to having a balanced budget. Um, I'm assuming a 2.5% increase in health insurance, and I've shared that with the school department for their planning. Um, We've, so far this year, had very good experience with our claims data, so I think we're in good shape. Um, generally, uh, the inflation rate for health insurance across the state has come down in, in the last year or so. Um, so uh, for budgeting purposes, we're going to start with 2.5%, keep our fingers crossed that we continue to have uh, good experience, and we may even at some point be able to lower that. Um, our retirement assessment um, is going up 7.5%. Uh, it's been a rocky year for a lot of pension funds. Um, their returns have um, have not met some of their expectations. So we do see that as go as jumping. And um, for those of you who are interested in capital, I'm recommending um, that we allocate seven percent of our levy to um, the capital that's funded through the JCPC. Um, the town policies say it should be um, ten percent. In the last couple of years, it's been 6.5%. Um, but the spending estimates that are built into this forecast are assuming that we go up half percent um, and start putting more money into our capital as provided for in our policies. So what does this mean? Um, about a one point, uh, almost a $2 million increase in revenue, allocating 3% to the, to the municipal departments. Um, Allocating 3% to the elementary school on a base that doesn't include that $218,000 of one-time free cash. So on a percentage basis, it's going to look like 2%. But if you're starting from, from the original base, it's really a 3%. Um, the same thing for the regional schools um, and for the library. And um, if you bring capital up to 7% of the tax levy, it's actually a 9.3% increase. Um, but as I say, um, it is in line with I think both our, our policies and what we really need to do to, to be spending money on these things. Um, and we see a major decrease in some of our uh, expenditures because our state assessments uh, were reduced because we moved our retired teachers out of the state group insurance commission. So that's a big savings on, on the town side and eventually passed on to the school department. Um, so you'll see that when you get into the nitty gritty of the numbers. Without additional revenue, um, it really allows for no uh, major expansion of our operating budget. Um, so the big picture, what's, what are we looking at going forward, some of our challenges? Um, as you've seen in the press and uh, from, from the town website, we know we have a challenge with CDBG funding. It is in jeopardy. Um, we're continuing to try to work on that, um, both in the short run and the long run. But um, as we're looking forward, um, to this forecast, which is not only FY14, but 15 and 16. We have to think about that as, uh, as a reality that we're going to have to deal with. Um, DPW operating budget 
currently relies a lot on Chapter 90, which is the state money to, to basically fund a bunch of positions in the uh, in the DPW for road work. Um, so there's a little bit of a structural imbalance in the DPW budget, which I think we need to address. Um, I'll talk about Chapter 90 a little bit in a minute on uh, uh, on the next slide. Um, the library has taken a um, very sober and serious look at the use of its endowment and um, has a long-term plan for, re for reducing the draw that it takes down every year out of its endowment, which um, I think reflects good long-term financial planning. But it's also going to have some impact and some challenges for us in terms of what that means for, for the library budget going forward. As I mentioned before, state revenues are growing, but they're growing slowly. Um, so we have to keep a, a, an eye on that. Um, and then, f you know, I think one of the things that you always have to be aware of is that there's every single department in town hall, in this room, across the town, can make a great case for spending more money. There are great things that we could do with more money in the library, in the schools, in town hall, in public safety. Um, as John mentioned before, maintaining fiscal discipline and uh, living within our means is uh, going to be very important. S sorting out those requests and those needs collaboratively has been our tradition um, and is also very important for us. Um, so threats and opportunities. We've had very good success with health insurance. We need to keep that up. If we revert to what the state averages are, it would have a major impact on our budget. Um, I had this up here last year. It's the same thing this year. We, we don't know what's happening in Washington. If there are federal cuts to programs, the sequestration um, that may go into effect uh, January 1st will first hit the state, and then it may roll down to us. Uh, so that is a major threat. And within this budget, we've put one-time OPEB uh, funding aside, but we have yet to commit to uh, in anything more than concept, the idea of a regular contribution to OPEB going into the future. So I think we need to, that, that is a threat to our budget in the long run. It's not all doom and gloom. There are opportunities for us, as I said before, and I think this cannot be underestimated. Continuing to collaborate with our employees on the control of health insurance is key, and uh, we will continue uh, to work on that. Um, regionalization, I think, is, um, I don't think, it, frankly, it's, it's going to be a big money saver in a lot of areas, but it is important. Um, and I say that particularly, I'm thinking about some of the town departments. I know on the school side, there's some major conversations. Um, and I think it is a big opportunity for us in all those areas, and we need to continue to look at it, um, because I think it, um, from saving on administrative costs, saving on administrative headaches, um, and being able to use the excellent resources that we've developed here to help out some of our uh, communities and in the end save some money is going to be very important. Um, and then finally, I think for an opportunity, um, I talked about Chapter 90 before. There's some major conversations going on at the state level about kind of a new partnership with state and local government on infrastructure funding, uh, changes to the Chapter 90 program, increased investment on, on the state level. Um, that could um, make a significant difference to the town. So I think it's a big opportunity for us. Um, and certainly, uh, I know I was at a meeting last night with, with Stephanie O'Keefe and Jonathan Tucker over at UMass where the State Department of Transportation was asking for local input on transportation funding. And we all advocated very strongly for increased state role in that area, uh, that cities and towns just can't do it on our own. Um, but if that does come through, I think you will see the impact of it out on our, on our streets and sidewalks and bike lanes and bus pullovers and so forth. For those of you who are looking for this information, it's on the town website at this address. And now I'm going to move into um, some very specific numbers. This is in your other sh uh, handout. There you have it. Um, so I just want to go through these numbers a little bit, point out um, some of the specifics, and then we can get into uh, questions. So of our revenue, um, property taxes are going up uh, $1.5 million, a regular 2.5% increase plus a half million dollars of new growth 
That means property taxes are going up 3.8%. Our local receipts, there are some areas that we've seen continued growth like motor vehicle excise and hotel motel tax. There are other areas uh, that have been lagging. In fact, this, this year we're having to reduce our investment income um, estimates. So we see modest increases there of 1.3%. Um, state aid, the only increase I'm forecasting at this point is an increase in Chapter 70 at the same dollar amount that we saw in FY13. Um, I believe it was, was it $50 a student? And um, so I'm predicting that the state will do that again this in, in FY14. I'm not predicting any increase in our other unrestricted general government aid. Um, that's where we got our big increase this year, but as the as a squeeze is put on state revenues, that typically has been an area where they've cut back on. Um, so the bad news is state revenue, although it's growing, is not growing at the pace that uh, they would like to see it. We do know, do know that the good news is that the lottery, which is where a lot of this unrestricted aid comes from, has been doing better than, than it has in the past, uh, or when they predicted. Um, sometimes the legislature has robbed some of that money to, to help the state budget, so we're certainly not counting on it. So that's why we're seeing a zero increase there. Um, other resources, um, so that's a very modest increase of, of less than half a percent. And then other resources we actually see going down because we're not relying on free cash. So we have a, a 3% increase in our, um, in our revenues. And then on the um, spending side, they said 3% across the board for, for all the four major components. Debt going up uh, and capital going up to 7% of the budget. And um, retirement going up by 7.5%, as I mentioned. Um, and then um, actually seeing a very uh, modest increases in um, our assessments for uh, from the cherry sheet. Um, overall, a balanced budget here. Um, exp the, n the expenditure number is going up s slightly more than the revenue only because we have a sort of surplus from the regional school assessment, which was voted about a month ago, to reduce that. So. If you add that and the revenue, it comes out to the expenditure number. Um, then the final thing I want to just talk about very quickly, within your packet, there's a lot of background information about FY12, and I'm not going to go into that. Um, but I want to talk about the calendar. Um, this is also up on the website as its own separate file. Um, so here we are on October 11th. Um, we've just gone through the preliminary. Um, Projections. Select board will start to discuss um, budget guidelines on Monday. As Andy Steinberg said, <coughs> the Finance Committee will also start discussing its guidelines starting tonight and going uh, through the rest of this month to give some guidance to the um, manager and the departments for where it thinks um, things should go. Um, and in the meantime, uh, starting at the end of this month, the town manager and I uh, will be meeting with the departments to go over their budget requests and their um, requests for ex existing and, and increased funding or changes in their budgets. That will take us up until um, the beginning of January when the manager will present his budget. And in the meantime, the school department, as you see here, um, is going through its budget process, and um, I want to make special note of, if I can find it here, um, in the purple, the library, which, um, much to its credit, has taken on the challenge of bringing its budget process in line with the, with the town budget calendar, um, and um, that's to be commended, and we look forward to the results of that. Um, so with that, I've been talking for a long time. Um, <coughs> I thank you for your patience, and I'd be glad to answer whatever questions you have. Thank you very much. Mr. Pooler, this is extraordinary information. I don't know that many cities and towns get this kind of historical uh, picture as well as uh, current outlook 
and in so much detail. And as Mr. Pooler emphasized at the beginning, the fact that we are getting this uh, together, that we are uh, all sharing in this information at the same time and that we'll be collaborating going forward, I think is really one of the secrets of the strengths of the various trends that uh, were being pointed out. Um, so thank you. I, I want to uh, emphasize this calendar document that Mr. Pooler is showing us here at the end. Uh, this is a living document. This is something that gets updated a lot. I'm looking at it going, oh, yes, yep, a couple of select board stuff. Things need to be, uh, to be adjusted. Um, by all means, keep getting those adjustments to Mr. Pooler so that the, uh, that the calendar that is on the website that's accessible to all is as updated as we can keep it. Um, so now I will open the floor to questions. It's a lot to digest quickly, so. <laughs> no questions. Oh, I'm sorry, Ms. Moran. And if, uh, if you could grab a mic for her. Thank you. Just want to clarify something about state aid. Um, on that, uh, the general fund chart, and you have state uh, unrestricted general fund aid staying the same as last year but that would be the, uh, staying the same as the increased amount, the 500000 that we got after the budget had been approved, right? Yes. So, in fact, uh, and we're, we're hoping to put that $500,000 into OPEB, but in the coming fiscal year, that 500000 will be coming into the general fund. That, that's use. right, and I, I think that's a very good point, um, and it really bears reemphasizing when I said we built FY14 on a strong FY13, it's really because we got extra state aid in FY13. In FY13, we're using that extra, we're recommending that it go to fund OPEB. But then we're using that as the building block, the base for the FY14 budget. Um, and it's really what's allowing us to have a, a balanced, stable budget in 14 using that base from 13. Other questions? Mr. Hayden. It's a bit of a nomenclature question. The, the, the yellow, green, and red, favorable and unfavorable to whom or to what? Um, I guess I could say our subjective judgment, but um, <laughs> yeah, I think um, Generally, it's meant to reflect favorable to um, the fiscal condition of the town and to the town's taxpayers. Um, I think it's meant to also, and depending on the chart, reflect um, good management practices or, or, or areas where we think that we're in trouble. So, um, you know, things like debt per capita, um, not only will it have a, um, an impact on the taxpayers, but just as a a management practice, keeping that number low is consistent with, I think, the best guidelines that you hear uh, as best pra practices. So I think it's a combination of those factors. Thank you. Other questions or comments? Okay, I will note that uh, this, this really kicks off the official beginning of the FY14 budget planning process. All of us will be talking about this information in much greater detail at our individual board and committee meetings. Um, this information that you have here, hang on to it, you'll refer to it often. Uh, it will be added to and augmented as we go along. We'll be getting a, a whole bunch of information from the schools when we have the four towns meetings. Um, those are on the calendar and I hope folks have gotten those on their calendars already. I think the, we've got one about regionalization coming up at the beginning of November and then the first budget one is in January if I'm not mistaken. Um, library folks as, uh, as uh, Mr. Pooler noted have aligned their budget calendar with the town's calendar which is a really big difference and that is going to just it be huge from a budget planning perspective. Um, ongoing collaboration about all of the these different elements, uh, the information sharing, the, the sharing of challenges and, and plans happens uh, at the budget coordinating group in particular. Um, all of us have representatives to that group and we all, we 
send back summary points from those meetings of the things we think that our board, home boards and committees need, really need to know. Um, this is really to keep us all very engaged in this process. We're starting off with a great deal of information and there are going to be a whole bunch of additions, subtractions, and changes to it as we go on. So uh, to the public at home, uh, tune in to our meetings. Uh, most of them are te televised uh, and really start paying attention because this is ultimately our goal is to get to town meeting next spring the town meeting date has already been set. I believe it's May 6th. Mm -hmm. That's probably on the calendar. Um, we're looking to get to next May 6th to uh, bring in a coordinated uh, and balanced budget recommendation to town meeting. So um, any other thoughts on questions or comments before we wrap up and the finance committee continues on into the night? Okay, for sure you will think of more questions as you have a, an opportunity to really uh, think about this information. By all means, be in contact with Mr. Pooler. Um, I'm sure you all have his email address, certainly have access to it. Um, and just do, do whatever you need to do to, to stay informed. And, uh, and thank you for participating. Mr. Steinberg. Yeah. Um, the Finance Committee is continuing to meet immediately afterwards in this room. So. Um, we, we, you're all welcome to, call, to to stay for the meeting, but uh, we'd appreciate it if you're going to continue long conversations to please take them out into the corridor so that we can meet properly. Thank you. Thank you very evening. much. Thank you. you so much. The rest of us are wrapping up our meetings at 735. Thank you. Stay for a few minutes or you I can if you'd like to. The first item I'm going to talk about. Oh, did you really? Oh, okay. Um, sure. sure. What we want to do is just hear briefly yeah. from uh, about funding. What we know, what we don't know, what okay. are the possibilities of transition funding and recommendations. Yes. Thank you. Oh. This is high. That, that, that worked out uh, yeah. perfectly. Nobody else would fit. I'm so happy. So thank you. <laughs> yeah, we were all afraid somebody <laughs> horrible would like that. It was scary. Uh, all right, we'll talk. All right. Okay. All right, good to see you guys. Thank you. And as always, have a wonderful meeting. Mm -hmm. You always do. Let's see if we can drag one. interested in, and I think that's why David's here too, is that um, what are the chances of transition funding, sure. as I say, what are the chances that this is going to be reversed, and if it, um, it's, a, it's three quarters effect, or, you know, on that year that we're planning for, and when will we get a recommendation on, on the changes that might be? anything we might need to consider during <laughs> the development of the guidelines. Those are basically oh, the okay. questions. Okay. But yeah, I told you. Yeah, it's a thing where, yeah, there's a reason that Alice and others always yeah. refer to that yeah. as the problem. Yeah. Yeah. From, from the base, if you, if you subtract out the two hundred and eighteen thousand from the meetings one time, right. Right. that they will then replace it by 14 percent. We'll have a better sense than even today, but it'll, it'll be an iterative thing. Yeah. So I think we all know the obvious, there, there, there are obvious conclusions to draw, and I can say them again in a minute when we're out loud, but um, the... It affected my thematic focus. Dave is coming back and... Yeah. Yeah, hi. John, did you see my email about Alice? Very small.
Uh, then we'll continue. Assume a new identity. <laughs> <laughs> we'll continue the uh, finance committee meeting. Uh, and uh, we want to discuss several topics for the um, special town meeting warrant um, article so that we can, that um, Mr. Pooler's going to tell us about. But before we do that, under news affecting budget, which is one of our standard items on all of our agendas. There is news affecting our budget. And uh, the uh, news, of course, is the CDBG news. And uh, so what I want to take just a couple minutes right now for the Finance Committee to um, hear a little bit more about um, is sort of the obvious questions that I would have and that you might have others. Um, certainty that this is going to happen, uh, the possibility for transition funding, uh, whether there's, you know, certainty is whether there's any review uh, possible uh, within this year. Uh, does this look like a long-term change? And then uh, we do need to start thinking about um, if we're gonna, as we go forward, if this grant is not going to be renewed and there's no continuation funding. Uh, the way the year works, uh, one quarter of the grant year that's affected, um, uh, let's see if I get it right now, three, qu three quarters of the year is, is an overlap, so we would lose three quarters of the grant during FY14. We would have, because um, it, it starts three months later, so we have to start thinking in terms of a significant uh, diminution of funding. We will need to have a, know when there's going to be a recommendation for whether this is going to require a change in other budgets within the town to continue um, what are the essential programs and uh, whether we should be considering that as we develop our guidelines because that was information not presented or discussed tonight. But if, we're, if it's going to cause us to have to think about any significant change in municipal funding, what does that mean for the recommendations around for uh, the, that were just presented? So those are basically the questions. And I don't know, um, John or Sandy, if you want to. Let me, let me take a, a stab at it. And uh, Sandy and Dave uh, Zomack can add to or correct or fill in the gaps. Um, as Sandy alluded to in the uh, budget projection presentation uh, a short time ago on our threats and opportunities slide, uh, one of the threats was that our CDBG funding uh, is in, in jeopardy. We've received preliminary word from uh, the State Department of Housing and Community Development that our uh, so-called mini entitlement status, uh, which is subject to review, uh, with updated uh, poverty data uh, every couple of years when they've used the updated census and other data. Uh, the scores for the 10 or so communities that are currently eligible for CDBG monies in the mini entitlement category like Amherst, their scores declined, but Amherst was the only one of those 10 whose status uh, on these preliminary findings changed from uh, mini entitlement status, which has gotten us 900,000 per year uh, the past uh, a couple of years for uh, uh, human services, social services needs, uh, our shelter, uh, big brothers, big sisters, first time home buyer, uh, fuel assistance, all those kinds of things, uh, immigrant services, uh, as well as some capital dollars, including the current project on Lower Main Street to install handicapped accessible crosswalks, sidewalks, bike lanes, bus pull-offs. Th those funds are in jeopardy beginning next October 1st. And so as Andy alluded to, that would affect us uh, uh, worst case, three quarters of next fiscal year and then thereafter. Uh, there are rules in the block grant program that allow if there are unexpended funds from 
uh, sources to incur expenses all the way through the end of December of next year, but that would be remain to be seen what, if any, uh, dollars we have beyond October 1st. But I think for purposes of guideline, uh, budget guideline deliberation, I think it kind of makes sense to think about the October 1. So that does have a domino effect on some of the programs that are funded uh, through the block grant as well as some uh, uh, staff support uh, in the town budget for the administration of the grant uh, that uh, is at risk. Uh, I don't have a definitive answer yet about uh, whether uh, that will be overturned and when. Uh, we, are, we have submitted a detailed uh, letter of appeal uh, as a town from me uh, with uh, a slew of uh, supporting information asking for a couple of things a walkthrough by the state of how they calculated our, our uh, uh, CDBG eligibility score uh, methodologically to make sure that it's, you know, uh, sound, uh, that it was consistently applied with all of the other communities uh, receiving funding uh, with the hope of, of some possible reconsideration uh, by the state on their judgment, we were just a fraction of a point below the minimum threshold. Uh, there's some rounding that's involved <coughs> in some of the categories. We want to make sure that it's not a methodological uh, thing that causes us to go from just above the eligibility threshold to just below it. Um, we've also requested that failing uh, reconsideration in that scenario that the state strongly consider granting us uh, what's called transition funding which we hope would be a sizable portion of the current year allocation uh, for at least one year uh, in, in so-called transition funding. That would allow us to uh, continue some of what we do uh, funded with the block grant program, but probably not all. Um, and so I think uh, uh, we've continued with our planning for prospective funding uh, recipients for next year, so we're ready. Uh, one of the arguments we're making is that we are uh, receiving notice of this uh, eligibility status very late in the game because when you are no longer a mini entitlement status, you are then eligible to compete for the competitive, annual competitive uh, CDBG grants. And the nature of that process uh, encourages regional collaboration and other things. And so as a practical matter, uh, for the town of Amherst to be able to, to submit a competitive uh, uh, CDBG application at this late date is severely compromised. So that would be another argument for at minimum uh, transition funding. Uh, so I can't say for sure the timing, but I would certainly expect to know for sure uh, before the end of the calendar year uh, whether uh, there is uh, what our prospects are for either restoration or uh, transition funding. Uh, we'll be meeting uh, in person, we believe, uh, in the next couple of weeks with, with state officials as they've digested the uh, letter of appeal that we've submitted. Dave what? He has copies of your Oh, Dave, do you have? Uh, I have copies oh. of your letter if Oh yeah, D Dave like has brought uh, copies of the packet that we submitted. It would be great for the finance community to have that as background. Material, so there's really nothing for me to do other than hand <laughs> Well, we appreciate your being here. <laughs> you did a great job. Yeah, I mean, the, uh, the, the, the difficult challenge for finance committee is going to be that we developed preliminary guidelines now we know what the context is from the presentation that we just had from sandy to the four boards uh, and uh, if there's going to be a significant effect on vital town programs that have been grant funded it is going to cause us to uh, need to consider other funding from the budget directly. We need to very quickly figure out how that plays into the whole budget development process and uh, 
guideline process and uh, the budget is pretty tight. Just, so I don't know if you have any thoughts about that, any of you. Well, I would say, you know, tonight we started out with a, a look at a, what we think our revenue forecasts are and, and making various allocations to the different uh, components of the budget. Um, so I guess I would suggest that what we do is have some discussion uh, either tonight or, or at our next meeting about what the assumptions are behind those revenue forecasts, make sure we're all feeling comfortable with those. I mean, that's the place to start. Um, it is a big unknown as to what the impact of this is going to be uh, for the FY14 budget. As, as John said, it could affect three quarters of the budget and it may affect less than that. Um, but it is a matter of um, what our, uh, what, you know, the spending side is. Um, so I think we start the conversation tonight. Um, we need to get more information back from the state. I think that, you know, there is a reasonable prospect of getting some sort of transitional funding. It's happened in the town in the past at least twice. Uh, well, at least once I know of for sure. There are, there's another time that other communities back in the late 90s had their funding cut and the state provided transitional funding for them at that point. You've raised a flag that this might be an area that we later in the process have to reconsider, you know, uh, allocations and, you know, sources of funding and things like that. Janice? Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> take a mic now. Um, so this really just affects the town side of the budget or does it have any implication for the library and schools? Well, it's a town impact. It's not a town municipal budget impact uh, directly uh, except for the, uh, um, you know, the staff that's administering the grant that's partially funded uh, by the grant. That's the kind of a, a direct impact on, on the, what, what would normally be considered the town budget. But it's, you know, it's a community grant. It's not a town grant versus a school or a library grant. Uh, I guess, um, sorry, would, would it, any of these numbers be incorporated in the library budget or the school budgets? I guess that's my um, question. Uh, not presently, although some of the social services funded by the grant complement, you know, Center for New Americans, for example, uh, or the, you know, Big Brothers, Big Sisters, working with, with young people uh, in the community. I mean, it's not a school budget item per se, but it, there's a, you know, there's a relationship. We, we moved the out-of-school time program funding, I believe, into the general, bu general budget. Um, there's now a town contribution to that program uh, in the uh, leisure services budget, and there's a creation of a revolving fund that program receipts come into that pay for a portion of it. There are also some costs contained directly in the... Uh, elementary schools budget for uh, uh, out of school time coordinator position and some other overhead and there's some federal grants uh, the schools are receiving for things like transportation that help to support this program as well. But my memory was that there's nothing from CDBG that that's right. goes into it. Uh, that's right. Only in prior years. Other questions at this point about CDBG? Um, okay. Do you have any th thoughts about when you might hear from the state? Uh, I think we'll know, uh, given the state's own planning process for uh, submitting their own, they're interacting with the federal government and coordinating that pass through of funds. Uh, I think it's reasonable to assume we'll know something pretty definitively uh, before the first of the year. Anything else from the committee questions or discussion on this topic?
I guess the answer is no, and uh, I appreciate the report. Um, this isn't information any of us or any of you I know are happy about, and uh, appreciate your aggressive work on trying to see if there's possibilities of uh, getting this changed. Um, but uh, we are going to have to talk about it over the next two finance committee meetings and make a decision on whether it affects the um, guidelines or whether we're just going to have to include language in the guideline letter, which is kind of what you're, yeah. I believe, suggesting at this point. If you have a change in a recommendation, and something more specific about essential programs that would become unfunded for part of FY14 because of the grant and you feel that they need to be reflected in the preliminary guidelines in any larger way, we do need to know that pretty quickly. Okay. Very good. So, there's nothing else I, uh, David, thank you. Sorry. Uh, and uh, John, thank you. Sure. All right. See you later. So I think that the other thing that we wanted to do this evening, um, and I'm going to um, actually go in um, order because we want to try and make sure that we cover a couple things on the uh, special town meeting warrant that we know about. and. Uh, that we can just take discussion on this evening and complete. And then uh, from there we can uh, see, I know that there was one follow-up question, I think one member had about uh, the presentation earlier this evening, see what um, there is. So those, that's generally where we need to go. Uh, Sandy, we had talked. Uh, Sandy and I had talked about this before, and in that preliminary list of articles that I had sent um, to everybody, which is again not an adopted warrant, so article numbers might change. So please bear that in mind. But uh, reports of boards and committees, uh, we usually. Uh, support that. Um, it's a, we usually are reporting committee. I don't think we've taken a vote on that yet. And Article 2 is transfer of paid uh, funds for unpaid bills from previous years. Again, we usually support that, but defer it to town meeting for recommendation because we wait to the last minute to see if there are any bills that come in. Uh, I think at this point we're not aware of any. So. Those two, I'll just pause to see if uh, uh, anybody wants to follow up with uh, quick motions to dispose of those. Okay. Move we support Article 1. Recommend. Okay, move so we recommend Article 1. Is there a second? Second. And Doug is seconded. This is the standard reports of boards and committees, which will include um, a report from the Finance Committee. Uh, the Regional School District Planning Committee, I think, will also make a request, but I'll take that up with uh, the right people for that. Excuse me. Uh, where are you looking? Uh, there was a sheet that I sent you. I don't have an extra copy that okay. looks like right. this, and it's just the list of the articles. We're only going to go through a few tonight. Um, this is Article 1, and it's the Report Supports and Committees. Any further discussion? Seeing no hands, uh, request for further discussion. All in favor indicate by raising hands. So six, it's six to zero with one member absent. Um, and Article 2, uh, which is the transfer of funds for unpaid bills. Okay. Do we need a motion to refer to town meeting, defer to town meeting? Um, I don't think so. I will just make note if there's any, any um, that we have made a decision to defer to town meeting. I don't. Um, I think that's fine. Article three is budget amendments. Um, Sandy. So at this point, um, because there's a separate article for putting money into the OPEB fund, which is sort of a. a 
a budget amendment, but it is a separate article. Um, at this point, there are no other amendments that we need to make to the budget. Um, so we could, I mean, frankly, we could take it up either place as a um, budget amendment or, it, which I think is a little more clear, as a separate article on the warrant here. Because what it is doing is it's taking FY13 estimated revenue, which is part of the FY13 budget, and, and amending that. But um, other than that, that w there's no action we need to take to amend the current year budget. Um, Article 7, as the preliminary list has it, is to appropriate $585,000 from FY13 estimated revenues to the OPEB trust fund. Uh, are you confident enough now to know that we're going to move to dismiss? This is usually a finance committee article. Um, well, I, you know, it, 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 it's sort of like the unpaid bills one that, you know, I, there's nothing that's come up and I really don't see the li likelihood that there is anything that come up. We could defer it to town meeting, but uh, I think in all likelihood it, we're not going to need to take any action. Okay. The warrant hasn't been signed yet, has it? No, it hasn't. We so have a warrant review meeting Monday morning. Why can't we do the OPEB um, transfer? under this article, under Article 3. We could. That's what I was saying. Is How does the Article 3 read now? Article 3, I mean, it hasn't been written, but what it is is it's budget amendments, and it's usually done as a uh, placeholder so that if there are amendments that need to be made to amend the FY13 budget, that um, they happen within the, that particular um, item, and uh, it's either not presented or dismissed if there's no budget amendments recommended. Usually budget amendments come about for the reasons that we talked about at the July meeting where you have overage in one department or um, that needs to cause us to make changes. Okay. I have rethought that. I think it should be a separate article. I mean, it, I, I put it as a separate article just because it's a big issue. It's the first time we're doing it. I think it deserves the attention. Um, and I kind of wanted to flag it for the public as something that's coming up, as opposed to just saying there's a budget amendment article and then you find out that it's really about OPEB funding. So technically, you could do it either way. I agree with uh, Kay. Okay. Yeah. okay. And the way I had written that actually in my notes was that Article 7, which is where it is provisionally now, um, is a separate article that we'd already acted on it at our last meeting, which we did. So we don't need to revote that tonight. And uh, I guess what I would leave it at. Um, Sandy, is uh, if you're confident by Monday morning that there will be no budget amendments, um, then you can ask that it be taken off the mm -hmm. warrant and it bumps everything up. If you feel that there might be some need for an amendment before town meeting rolls around at the end of November and you want to reserve the option, then it's better to leave it on the warrant even though there's nothing anticipated behind it at the time that the warrant is issued and then let it be dismissed at town meeting. And that's a matter of confidence sure. that there's nothing there. So um, why don't we leave it at that, that you'll make a recommendation at the warrant review meeting on Monday that if, there, if it's going to be dropped off, that will change the numbering anyway because there would be no three. Um, so, uh, I don't think any action is necessary. I think everybody understands where we are. Article 4 uh, was referred to during your presentation, dead article for roads, and um, we are going to hear more about that uh, from Guilford, um, who's going to come to, uh, I think, our next meeting. Uh, and. Uh, 
Uh, so Mr. Mooring will uh, tell us about what is anticipated, and you, I think, gave a demount already in the presentation earlier. One million dollars, yes. And we made a presentation, JCPC gave me one to speak to that. JCPC voted unanimously to recommend this. So we could uh, vote tonight and still receive a report from Mr. Mooring about his road plan, or we could wait. It really wouldn't matter uh, because I think the, the vote isn't a complicated vote when we get there. We will be better informed after we hear from Mr. Mooring. So unless somebody makes a motion, I'm going to go on from there. Um, the next one that is list, next two that are listed, and I'll let you say what we can do tonight or what you can report tonight on it, are um, five and six multi-year solar agreement. One is um, solar agreement with Altru, which I think we cannot do anything about tonight because there's no information on which we can act. Um, and then the second one is multi-year solar agreement with Blue Wave and Smart Energy. Um, as you know, we have a solar project at the old landfill. Um, the original scope of that project was 4.75 megawatts. When we signed the power purchase agreement um, with Smart Energy this summer, um, John Nisanti made a presentation to the select board about it, and he mentioned at that time that one of the things we were looking at is instead of building the full-scale 4.75 megawatt project at the landfill, to perhaps build a smaller project, um, one that we hope maybe wouldn't have some of the impacts on the neighbors that the neighbors are complaining about. <laughs> maybe we can help resolve litigation by changing the footprint and so forth. But we still need the electricity, and so the way to that solar power, the way to get that, would be to sign a deal with these same developers for a different site. The different site would be outside of the town of Amherst. They have a couple of other sites outside of Amherst that they are looking at. They're in negotiations with town officials and landowners and so forth. Um, but because it's a multi-year contract, we would need um, town meeting approval. So um, as I said, we've mentioned this at the time we signed the, the deal with Smart Energy this summer. Um, now this is coming to town meeting to get that approval. Overall, we'd still be buying the same amount of solar power, but all of it might not necessarily come from the landfill. It'd be under the same financial terms as the landfill power, so financially it wouldn't have an impact one way or the other, um, but it might give us some flexibility in redesigning the landfill project, and, and we're in the midst of working on that with the engineers to see how we can reconfigure it, and then eventually, as soon as we have that done, which will be very soon, going out and talking to the neighbors and see if it, it you know, if they like it any better. Okay. If, if that actually all, all works out, we would lose some amount of property tax revenue, right? If it's a smaller installation on the landfill? Well, um, no, y yes and no. Um, I sound like a lawyer, but I guess <coughs> I am. <laughs> Um, yes, technically we would, but our agreement with Smart Energy and Blue Wave is that the, the amount that they have to pay in property taxes is matched by an increase in the amount we have to pay for the electricity. So it's a zero-sum game. The underlying economics of the deal is the electricity. That's why we're, s we're, we're making or, or saving money. The property taxes are a wash. Anurag is the next. No? Sure. Well, you know, I just had this. If uh, if the project is going to be reconfigured so that it's broken down into two, basically two projects, the economics won't change? We already have a, um, a preliminary deal that's only awaiting the, the specific sites with Smart Energy and Blue Wave that give us the exact same per kilowatt hour price for the electricity we'd be buying. Okay. 
that, uh, that, that, that answers my question. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to get into the ethical slash moral implications of extortion, but um, I, I would say that uh, unless there are, is substantial legal threats, that not utilizing our asset, our landfill, to a maximal level to produce our share of green energy at a cost to a few citizens, we all have to pay for the green future, is reprehensible. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, not much of a follow-up I can make to that because um, not, uh, do I think you were looking for one? I think that the question that the Finance Committee is going to have to determine is whether we support the article um, and uh, we can wait um, for the, until we actually see the wording. I think that it is principally a request um, as in the past for um, authorization from town meeting for the town manager to enter into a contract for a term longer than is permitted um, without town meeting authorization. And uh, we did support the similar article in the first round because we recognized that this whole solar project would produce um, revenue and savings for the towns of a significant por amount of money and uh, for that reason we recommended it uh, and uh, that will essentially I think be the question before us whether we vote on it right now or wait until we see the language and uh, if I don't hear a motion I'm going to assume that that's a request to wait until we see the language and then we'll just take it up at the next meeting or the meeting thereafter uh, but I think we've basically heard about it so that we don't, we don't need to have substantial discussion then except about any wording or follow-up questions. And the other um, multi-year solar agreement is um, totally unrelated and uh, it's my understanding from our prior discussion that it's just too early to present and it does need to wait until the subsequent meeting. It's it is still under review with council and um so yeah we're not ready to present something tonight okay Andy. Yeah. yes interact is, is it possible to know uh because right now the landfill uh area is really town town property if the project was broken into pieces the second property will that be town property as well no it would be a property outside of the town of amherst it's within the Wamiko or Wemco district. It has to be there, but um, it is in a in a nearby community. So they generate the power. They feed the power into the grid. We get credit for the feed into the grid. Just the same as at the landfill. It's all fed into the grid. We get credit for that. I don't understand, though, why we would get credit for it when it's no longer in the town of Amherst. Um, because you're allowed to be the host customer. The town of Amherst can be the host customer for a solar array that is built anywhere within Wamiko. But how about, the, how about the people who actually own that land? Will they not really get a portion of the proceeds? I mean, they, 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 will, they won't be ceding their economic rights uh, for free. Um, no, the people who own the land, um, the, the people who are developing the project, Blue Wave and, and um, Smart Energy, will pay them something for, you know, they'll, they'll basically lease their land from them for, for something so that you can put solar panels on it in the same way that you, if you lease somebody less land to put a building and a business on it, you would get the benefit of the lease, but then if the building, if the made, and the business made money, you're not necessarily going to share in that. So they're going to get a lease payment, and we're going to get the benefit of the solar energy. Well, from our point of view, the main issue would be: uh, does the is there any uh, non-trivial financial impact for the town? 
of that, if you know this. Sure. So the the impact is that we're going to um, be buying electricity <laughs> from Blue Wave and Smart Energy at one price, and we're going to get net metering credits from Wamico at another price, and the difference between those are, are, are the profit or the electricity savings is another way to look at it that, that is going to benefit the town. And what we have locked in with, with Blue Wave and Smart Energy is that the price we're going to pay for that electricity from this other project is the same that, as the price we would pay for electricity from the landfill. And then the amount we get back from Wamico is set by state tariff. That's the same in either case. So that spread is still going to be the same, the economic benefit to the town is the same. We're going to pay at one price. We're going to get net metering credits at another price. And that's the fundamental economics of the deal. And what about uh, Kay's earlier question about the property taxes again? Uh. So for the, um, the landfill project, there's a clause within the power purchase agreement that says that there's a, uh, an add-on to the electricity price, dollar for dollar, for every dollar of um, property taxes that we charge. So it's a, it's a zero sum, property taxes end up being a zero sum game um, because when we put out an RFP for, the, for this project, they, they responded and said, we will sell you electricity at this price if there's no property taxes, at this price if there are property taxes, at this other price if there are even higher property taxes. And so we said property taxes, and, a, property taxes change from year to year as things assess, are assessed, and as what you're really taxing is the uh, solar equipment. And like any equipment, it depreciates over time, so that changes. So we figured, A, it was better just to have this adjustment clause so it's a zero-sum game. The other thing is that... Um, Certainly when the town first started this, there was a lot of question as to whether cities and towns could come to agreements to exempt these projects from property taxes altogether. Over the last 18 months, I think that's been clarified that you do have to charge property taxes, but as we were negotiating the PPA, that was still somewhat in flux, and so we decided the best way to deal with it was with this escalator, this add-on clause. So the property, the outside of the town, which the, which will then be used, the other town will be get prop, will you get paid property taxes, right? Yes. And will that be added to our cost? No. The 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 amount we're paying for electricity is is the amount we're paying, and the developer will have to. So the developer will have to then kind of uh, accommodate those extra additional costs. Mm -hmm. So their economic their economics actually deteriorates by going outside the, town, outside the town. Right. And I, I think it somewhat depends on... Sure, but it does. Right. I mean, what about... Well, if, they double how, their, if they double the property tax... How, yeah, how a small might be, you know, they will have to kind of eat that. Right. Uh, and, um, okay. I mean, I just, I just needed to clarify that because they are... It's good by question. going outside the town, the developer will be taking a bit of a loss, a bit of a expense that they would not have incurred had, if they stay in the town... So there must be some incentive for them to, to do that. Frankly, it's as long as I'm paying six and a half cents or six and three quarters cents for a kilowatt hour, the economics of their deal I can speculate about, but it's their deal. And okay, no, that's fine. You know, in uh, uh, what goes around comes around. You know, they they will in, they will find a way to kind of. Uh, get whole again on this that's fine yeah no i'm, I'm you know and i think they're smart people they know they're you know they got the spreadsheets and okay yeah the other uh one which uh is a different arrangement entirely and is going to have to wait for a subsequent meeting so i think we've done what we can do um since we've taken care of what are listed as eight and nine the transfer of funds to stabilization excuse me, seven and eight, and the appropriation to the OPEB trust fund. Um, the other ones I sent you a note on will be, will be meeting with 
staff and or petitioners on October 25th for most other uh, ones that are not zoning related and November 1st for anything that is zoning related either um, by petition or um, by uh, planning board request. So um, the uh, Mr. Tucker, uh, Mr. Mooring, uh, will be here and other staff for those uh, that are appropriate for those particular articles. Uh, so I don't think there's much else we can say right now on the warrant and uh, unless there are questions. Seeing none, then uh, I think we're um, on to the next agenda item, which is discussion of the financial projections that were presented earlier this evening for FY14 um, and then any initial uh, discussion of preliminary budget guidelines. Uh, Bob, did you have a question that you had started? You know what? Um, uh, my role was to be the, the bear, right? And, <laughs> and, and this, this fiscal cliff will have lots of implications and I'm only, I, I just wonder if there's any work being done behind the scenes to calculate what that might be if you start to get these uh, changes in the fiscal policy at the federal level and it ripples through the state to the to the local level if you can get any guidance or anticipation of that now I know that it might be a year before it all has big implications but uh, I'm wondering if there's any way to quantify it I, I, and I I also wonder if there's any reason to do a dual budgeting exercise in the sense that there's it's kind of a binary process isn't it it's either or and it's anybody's guess what the heck is going to go on here um, let's turn to the forecast and um, look at some of the numbers. And I think that will address some of the questions you have. So if you all turn to um, the first page of the forecast. What, what is all there, we nine. Okay. So it's, it looks like this, mm -hmm. and it's the revenues. Um, so, to directly answer the questions that, that Bob asked, what we know about sequestration is that there are some things that are subject to sequestration at the federal budget level. The defense budget, for example, a lot of social programs, grant programs, and so forth. Those are subject to cuts. What is not subject to cuts are the so-called entitlement programs, so Medicare and Medicaid and so forth, which, as you know, Medicaid is a huge part of the state budget, and the state budget relies in large part on that money, um, is not subject to se sequestration. So bad things may happen on January 1st, but they're not going to affect the biggest dollar amounts to the states. You know, they could affect things like grant programs like Title I, which goes to the schools and so forth. Um, but quite frankly, we don't know yet what, what, what's going to happen, and I think it's anybody's guess as to um, who's going to blink first on sequestration. My own opinion is it's a completely untenable, untenable political arrangement, and it's not going to happen. It, it, it was an expediency the at the time that it was put into place, and it's not going to happen on January 1st. I don't know what's going to happen on January 1st, but it's my best estimate that that is not going to happen on January 1st. Something else is going to happen. Um, you know, we've talked to the MMA. I was just at a conference of the New England Government Finance Officers Association listening to a lot of people. I have heard nothing that is a, what I could say is any kind of tangible best guess about the impact on the state budget or on our budget. So. I don't have numbers for you to say, you know, e even if we had two budgets, right. I, I could pull a number out of thin air, but it wouldn't be based on any kind of best guess. Um, it's just too early to tell. Um, and um, 
it's obviously very important. We're listening to people all the time. John sits on the MMA Fiscal Policy Committee where, you know, it's kind of the holy of holies of the MMA to talk about um, what's going on on the state budget level. And we just haven't heard anything that is that you can take an action on. Um, so then getting to why I wanted to turn to this was that in FY14, as I mentioned in the presentation, I made a forecast of a very modest increase in state aid uh, of $50 per student. It's 0.9% uh, on Chapter 70. It's overall an increase of 0.04%. In subsequent years, I um, put very modest increases in state aid, 1% for each of Chapter 70 and general government aid, which is... Um, which I think is low. I think, in other words, I'm trying to hedge our bets right. with that. I also um, did increase some of the local receipts, um, but the overall increase there is a modest 1.3%. Um, so I think this, these are very conservative revenue estimates. Now having said that, there are, there are Deficits in FY15 and 16, if you look at the n bottom of the next page, there's deficits of 300 and 600,000. I went back and compared to what those deficits were, the two-year deficits from a year ago, and they were even bigger. Um, so um, I don't want to say that we're in great shape with these numbers and so forth, but um, you know, I think this far ahead Traditionally, we've seen deficits that big or bigger going forward. Um, it also, by the way, it assumes 3% growth in spending, which obviously if things happen, I mean, that's, that's a big assumption. That's a lot of money. Um, and if things fall apart at the federal level, frankly, we won't be able to have 3% increases. And you know that's gonna be part of our collective bargaining and our, our, our spending assumptions. Um, speaking to collective bargaining, um, in these out years where we've got a couple years ahead, were you, from the standpoint of the cost for those new contracts that are coming up, and you know the big debate is typically what's the COLA for the employees as a major impact on the overall dollars. What did you utilize in 15 and 16 for that because those contracts haven't, are not locked in yet? Did you say with the same percentages we currently have under contract, or did you? I understand the question and I'm not going to answer it. <laughs> I'm not going to say what our assumption about COLA is. Right. No, I didn't mean to ask yeah, that. Okay. I just, what I'm assuming is overall spending increases of 3%. That, that's built in. Right. Okay. Yeah. I think that the, one of the things that you said, um, something that I've been thinking about and sort of relates back to others, um, schools in the town have been relying on grants. We had a substantial discussion already about uh, CDBG and the town grant. Um, you made reference to Title I and IDEA being at possible risk on the school grant side. We all know that those uh, are important programs that are funded to the schools in the town and to town meeting. and. Uh, it, it um, still leaves me a little bit uncertain as to how how we're going to go forward and adjust for that if we need to go forward and adjust for that. And uh, you know, I I don't want to beat it to death, but I did want to throw the schools into the mix because those are two grant programs that are fairly significant for the schools. No, you're you're absolutely right, and and. You know, I, I wish I could give you an A and a B budget with some real numbers. Uh, the town relies on, on grants, you know, n notably CDBG for programs and for staffing. The schools certainly rely uh, a big way on, on grant money. Um, if these horribles happen, if we lose all the CDBG and there's no transition, if sequestration happens and these Title I grants get cut January 1st, I think at that point, it's a whole new world 
you know, you, you pointed out quite rightly, Andy, that it's very hard to go back to the school department and say later on, oh, we said we're going to give you X dollars, but now we're giving you Y dollars. But if these grants go away, it's got to be a town-wide discussion about all these things. Um, and um, so it's a little scary to say that. Uh, I'm sure uh, Maria and her staff are, are looking at those with, with trepidation. But um, we really don't know, you know, there, there, there's nothing more to say at this point about, about it other than that it's a threat. Except hope it doesn't happen. And I, hope, you know, I, I concur. Hope. <laughs> yeah. But, but I think I'm I could also going to see um, Bob's point that, you know, you know, if you can anticipate to the extent we might be able to anticipate, it might help us thinking through if it comes to pass. Um, but, you know, but obviously we can, you know, there's no really concrete guidance on how to, how to even think about that at this point. So, uh, I do have one question really quick. Um, does, um, you know, like, um, Doug just mentioned there's uh, all these uh, contracts that are for negotiating this year. Are these generally uh, multi-year contracts, uh, three-year contracts? They're generally three-year contracts, yes. Uh, and is there, um, I mean, is, are the potential impact of those negotiations or those contracts already incorporated in some fashion in these budgets and your projections? Um, so this- You have to give us the details, but are they kind of incorporated in this? Um, Yes, the short answer is yes. Um, we ran through some hypotheticals internally and looking at what the impact of different contract settlements would be. There are certain fixed costs we, we know we have for things like steps and people have changed positions and all that stuff. And so you put that all into the mix and that informed uh, some of our, some of my thinking about you know, if budgets went up 3%, are we even in the ballpark of being able to settle reasonable contracts or aren't we? Um, I think we are in the ballpark of being able to settle reasonable contracts. With the, with the projected deficits? In, in um, how do years? Well, uh, frankly, I was mostly focusing on 14 with that. Okay. I mean, Again, if you could look back at the history of these projections in yeah. past years, they always show deficits in the out years. And so you, um, you have to deal with it as a combination of trying to settle reasonable contracts. Once you have those contracts la locked in, you then have to live with the consequences of those contracts. So either you have a contract that means you have to make some staffing cuts or make changes, or you don't, and All you right. just have to deal with that. Hey, did you have something? Just that in our uh, guidelines document, we're going to have to um, uh, emphasize that these really are preliminary guidelines and that there's a whole um, set of unknown circumstances that at this point we can't uh, incorporate. I think that's kind of where we are, unfortunately, because um, we, uh, at this point, unless uh, there's a change of heart by our, um, our next meeting when we actually have to vote guidelines, uh, I think we would uh, need to essentially say that we're going to go with the recommendations and with that language that Kay has just referred to. And I wanted, I didn't want to do that, to, I think that's a discussion for the next meeting, but uh, I wanted you to have opportunity to ask all questions that seem logical now. Yeah, Andy, can I just say one more thing? Yes. And that is, so <coughs> there are two parts to the guidelines, two parts to this forecast. You know, one is uh, how much revenue are we gonna have? And um, I, again, I'd be happy to answer specific questions about any of the numbers that we have here. If, if you look at these figures, you can compare our projections in 14 to what our actual collections were in in, um, in FY12, which is the last year where we had collections, and you can see the extent to which um, these things are uh, are different from those. I think what you'll see overall 
is as a general matter, um, the FY14 projections are still below our FY12 actual collections. Um, and so for things like motor vehicle excise, which is um, one of the bigger categories, that's true, hotel motel tax. It's not true, but you have to keep in mind that the Lord Jeffrey Inn is open for a full year. Uh, but for the rest of them, they're either uh, at or below or very close to what our uh, FY12 actuals were. Um, the one big change is the miscellaneous category at the bottom of local receipts. And that's because the bulk of that miscellaneous category is money that the schools reimburse the town for charter and choice and, and, te and retired teachers' health insurance. And the retired teachers' health insurance went away from our costs, so it went away from their reimbursement. So I just, I, I think it's important to note that property taxes are set, we know what they are, that's locked in. Local receipts we can play with, but we've tried to do it in a responsible way for FY14, so we're not overshooting our past performance. Um, and state aid, I already said, we have some modest increases there. I, with any luck, there'll be an upside to that, but um, I'm not counting on it. And the other things um, are, uh, you know, they are pretty much what they are. So all of which is to say, um, if you're comfortable, and I, I would say that I think there's good reasons to think that we should be comfortable saying that we have a 3% increase in revenue, we have that much money to spend. We then have some big questions about if we allocate 3% to the town and the school and so forth, and some of these horrible of horribles happen, what the town and the school committee does about that, whether we keep spending on the exact same things we're spending on today or we re have, have to reallocate and make some tough choices about things that we're spending money on that we might have to cut or so forth. That's a whole different discussion. Um, it's a longer discussion. It's a more complicated discussion. Um, I, I think having some clarity on in terms of the guidelines of comfort level with the revenue side is a little bit of an easier discussion to have and, and something we could come to a conclusion for earlier. Did you say that the projected 14 was um, less than actual 12? Is that what you just, um, I m must have misheard you. For, for the local receipts, for, for yes. Which one? <laughs> for, so if you look at, for example, motor vehicle local excise. Receipts. You see, we co actually collected 1,559,000, but projecting for 14, only 1.4 yeah. 1. million. Okay, okay. Um, all right, thank you. And all along, you can see that that's, that's pretty much the case. So how many Excel files do you have? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'll never tell. <laughs> A lot. <laughs> Anything else, Jen? Which line had the um, reimbursement to the town from the schools? The last one under local receipts, it's called miscellaneous. And you can see that in the notes way over on the far right-hand side. It says APS charter and choice reimbursements, no teachers, GIC. Yes, Doug. So that difference of about 500,000 is the the, uh, the GIC piece, the switching of the retired teachers from GIC back to our own health care trust fund? Okay. Yep. Anything, anything additional for discussion now? Because we will have to deal with this at the next meeting, so obviously we can pick up with the more questions that you think about as you look at this information and ponder it more carefully. Um, then to move along so that we can get home for people who are just dying to see the vice presidential debate, um, any member reports on liaisons or committees? Doug? I can report to this if he's in once. Kay wants to. Oh. Well, we, I said what our only business yeah, was. We, we met and discussed the roads and recommended it, but, but we got a, um, the recommendation, just to be a little more specific, which we'll probably hear from Guilford next week or whenever we meet next, um, 
is that the roads they're looking to uh, borrow money to repair are roads that are, what was the official term, minor something, I forget. Uh, but the idea is that they're, you know, uh, lesser traveled neighborhood minor roads. Local. Minor what? Minor local. Minor local, which yeah. means they're ours and they don't have a lot of traffic. It's typically commute to work, come home kind of traffic. And then often when we repair those kinds of roads, uh, they might last 25, 30 years. So it's a, it's a, uh, you get a lot of value out of that. Uh, they, they stay good for a long time. So that was uh, the specifics of which roads is, you know, subject to much debate and not really in our wheelhouse. And we'll hopefully avoid that. But anyway, <laughs> I was the line chair of our meeting. We all have suggestions, I'm sure. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Yes, those of us who live in North Amherst have one very big suggestion. <laughs> Andy, on our guess. Yes, interact. I just have a clarifying question. You said uh, to raise $1 million for road repair. Um, when you do these bonds, you pool a bunch of these projects and do a bond. What's your minimal, minimum amount for a bond issue? Like, you know, $10 million or... Um, we typically are in the upwards of $5 million range. So there is other debt that we will issue. We're going to issue debt in March. Yeah. There's other debt that was authorized at um, town meeting that will get us, I forget what the total is, uh, I don't, all right off the top of my head, but we're typically issuing debt somewhere in the 3 to $5 million range each time we, we issue debt. And w what, is it pretty expensive to issue that debt? I mean, you know, for like a $5 million debt, will the issuance cost will be well, there, there's two costs. There's legal fees and there's uh, our financial advisors, and it is on a sliding scale depending on the size of the debt. Um, it's in the it's in the fifty thousand dollar, sixty thousand dollar range. So that's why we do try to just do it once a year, and and combine projects. And um, I mean, the number that you showed, I caught part of your presentation when you were talking about the. Uh, um, ratings, like we have a double A, yeah. but our, our finances seem fairly strong. I yeah. mean, you know, so why are we not triple A? Well, that's one of the things we like to ask Standard and Poor's, and we won't be making that's that argument, but uh, we're not as, the triple A's typically are much wealthier communities. It's the Concords and Newtons and Wellesleys and so forth. So a big factor in um, a, a rating is your uh, underlying economics. So it's the it's the value of the houses, um, and and so forth, uh, and we're pretty good. I th I think for a lot of reasons we're in that same class, but we have to convince them. So what is interesting to me is you know and there may not be an answer to this. What is interesting to me is that we are a fairly strong financially fairly strong town. Yes. Uh, we manage the finances well over over a number of years and. Um, we benefit from that uh, with a triple A, with a double A rating. Uh, does that in any way have an impact on mini entitlement status? I mean, on the one hand, we are very strong uh, financially, fairly strong financially. On the other hand, we are uh, in need of money for um, for programs. Uh, how the the short answer is. I would ask Dave Zomack to really answer that. Um, we are affected in weird ways by the number of students we have. It affects, us thi it affects things like our per capita income, which sometimes counts for us and sometimes counts against us. But to get into the specifics, I would okay. say Nate Malloy, actually, in the planning department, is the one who really knows those numbers and can tell you how they affect us. Well, what, I, cause I wonder, what I'm wondering is that the, uh, the agency or authority that's uh, making a determination on whether or not we qualify for mini entitlement or not, if they're also looking at a double A rating and looking at the finances and saying, wait a minute, you guys are doing okay. Th there, there's a set of criteria they have to evaluate. There's a set of numbers. Your bond rating is not one of them. Okay. All right. Okay. Hey, anybody else? The only thing that I would just to remind you of is that November 3rd, Saturday morning, is, the, is a special for town meeting. And there is a financial interest in this. This is uh, finance committees are deliberately invited because um, 
there are financial impacts, positive or negative, to changing from um, a town-based school system to a regional school system. Um, we just, as a regional school district planning board, um, concluded a, uh, a process to choose a financial consultant for the first part of the work who's going to help um, assess what the financial costs and benefits might be to the various models under consideration. And it's actually somebody who Sandy has worked with previously, Mark Abrahams. Um, but uh, this does, there is substantial financial piece to it, and that's why I would encourage you to um, uh, be knowledgeable. And uh, we um, are expecting that Senator Rosenberg and both Representatives Kulik and Story um, say they will attend. Um, we know that there are large transition costs that would incur if we have to, and we want. To, we need to press them to pay the transition costs. The largest transition cost is um, salary equalization because the Amherst and Pelham salaries paid to teachers uh, are higher by and large than the salaries paid to the teachers in the two, na two neighboring towns that would join in a region if we went down that path. And that becomes um, a uh, cost that we would hope to find some assistance to bear, and that's part of what the discussion you might hear that night are. Um, the minutes of previous meetings, I think we have one uh, to take up, which is July 12th, 2012, and uh, they were recently uh, sent out again by Kay to everyone. Okay. Cindy found a straight parenthesis that we should take out. <laughs> Third line from the bottom at the very end. Uh, yeah. um, After 2012, there's a parenthesis. Oh. You see, you, the you put it up. right there. There's yeah. no. Oh, oh. oh, I see. It needs to have one. Okay. Got it. Anything else noted? Hearing no other changes, then a motion would be in order. Doug. I'll move to recommend adoption of the amended minutes of July 12th. Second. Uh, I think that, uh, okay, we had Doug making a motion and Anurag has seconded the motion to approve the minutes as amended. Uh, any further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor indicate by raising hands. Let's see, uh, looking at the attendance on that, I think we were all, uh, so, yeah, so that's uh, five and one, ab zero, one abstention, one member absent. So it's five, zero, one abstention, one absent. Uh, so I think that that takes us through the agenda because uh, I have nothing to add to it and uh, we're gonna be pressed to get home for the debate as it is, but we'll see most of it. So I wanna thank Amherst Media and thank everyone at home for their interest and in, uh, our next meeting will be on uh, October 25th and the following meeting, I believe, will be then on November 1st. And I think that the October 25th meeting uh, will be in our regular place. The November 1st meeting will need to be at the Bang Center and you'll get reminders of that. And with that, I guess we're adjourned at uh, 8.55.